Welcome everyone. I'm Angelo Robles to the Angelo Robles podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart, and other platforms. I'm also the founder and CEO at Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to families of great success and their single family offices. I'm really excited about today's interview. I'm interviewing someone I've known for ooh, about five years now. The first time I met him, he was down in Florida back January of five years ago, and he did a fantastic job as a presenter. I'm fortunate to get a chance to know him over the last couple of years and really, really enjoy him and his team's writing and blogs. And that's what spurred me to reach out to Alan. That's his name. We'll introduce him in a second. But I did steal from his amazingly creative team because I love the title to make it my title of the what we call a podcast today. And that is Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. Then I added, much more boring, but I guess highlights what we'll be talking about, a discussion on the economy, finance, and where to invest. Today, our special guest is Alan Snyder, Managing General Partner of Shinnecock Partners, a 30-year-old family office investment boutique, and its investment funds, General Partner, Shinnecock Group. Alan, it's been too long since I last saw you, even though it's digital. How are you? Peachy dandy, and it's uh, an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you're very kind. And again, I'm certainly uh, a big fan of your intellectual prowess. You also built a great team. And I'm really, really excited to have a discussion. Uh, and probably the last investment discussion I'll have in August, well, that's because, of course, the new month is coming up soon. Uh, but we got so much going on during COVID-19. And this has really changed everything for so many people. And logically, I mean, it would be like March and April, things were going to hell in a handbasket with the stock market, with the economy. I'm gonna say the economy is still pretty lousy and very concerning from a long-term perspective, yet somehow, well, somehow through propping it up with trillions of dollars and a little bit of pixie dust, somehow the markets have done, you know, quote unquote, at least where we left off at a low, very, very well. What I'm going to do, Alan, is I'm going to read, because I think it sets the tone, a paragraph from the before mention between the devil and the deep blue sea. And of equivalent, equity markets reach new heights almost daily, you wrote, uncoupled from GDP results this year, or maybe even next. Interest rates are at record lows with the Fed opinioning no negative rates. Ergo, there is limited, if not non-existent, upside for fixed rate bonds with untoward sword of Darniscus downside in the event of any rate rise. For nervous Nellies like ourselves, let's focus on the debt side of the equity debt mix, where 60-40 or some other percentage mix. Well, that was much more eloquently written than my, my poor reading and pronunciation of certain words, but we'll look past that. Uh, I don't want to ruin my reputation after all. So, of course, I'm going to mispronounce things that only lives up to a little bit of what I do, apparently, Alan. But on that note, let's dive really into what I said and what you said there. This is kind of a once in a lifetime event. I hope I never see something like this again. The end is nowhere near in sight. We're not at a vaccine, let alone, is it gonna work? How is it gonna be rolled out? How is 70% of the population gonna get it? I think eventually that will happen, but we're probably looking at arguably 10 to 18 months from now. Yet the markets, broadly in terms of the equity markets, for some of the reasons that I noted, but I wanna hear your reasons, have, again, broadly speaking, held up. Why is this and what's your opinion? Well, first of all, Angela, you framed it very well. The equity markets, you know, are trading at uh, 26 times uh, current earnings, 23 times 2021 earnings, which uh, I think will be lower than forecast. If you look at the Schiller Cape Index, it's uh, maybe higher than it's ever been. So you have 
on the one hand, these uh, very, very cheery equity markets. On the other hand, you have some of the economic challenges, which I call the seven scurrilous economic challenges. Just to paint the picture a little more deeply, you have a global recession. The World Bank says that 93% of global economies are down and worsening, particularly in emerging markets. You have a slump in world trade. World trade historically has had positive benefits. You have huge debts <clears throat> pretty much across all economies that people are trying to <clears throat> excuse me, cover the COVID challenges. U.S. per capita GDP has had its largest decline in the last century. 70% of GDP is driven by consumers, and consumers are getting pounded, as we know. 50% of GDP is service-based. Think of restaurants and all the related businesses that are closing, sadly, for them. And last, and I sort of smile and I think about how it's reported in the newspaper. <clears throat> People said, well, filing for new unemployment benefits ticked down again this week. Now, new requests are only 1 million. Think about that. You still have huge unemployment ever, ever so slowly increasing. All right, that's on the uh, side that you painted so well. The argument against it, of course, is, oh, throw out earnings in 2020, look at earnings at 2021, maybe even discount that and look at 2022. And of course, that old bromide, never fight the Fed or in this case, an election year with fiscal uh, emoluments being passed out liberally. And I suspect that uh, Nancy Pelosi will reach some accommodation, or at least I hope so, with Mark Meadows and the administration, and that there will be further uh, fiscal stimulation. The U.S. economy bottomed in April. And the mathematical argument um, would be that P multiples aren't really so high because you look at the discount rate against future earnings because interest rates are so low. Maybe. Now, I'm old enough, I hate to admit this, that I remember earlier times, and with the Fed now saying, moving into current times, the Fed saying, well, let's run hot. In fact, uh, even more recently, Jerome Powell has said, <clears throat> well, let's overshoot and not worry about our 2% hurdle for inflation. You saw a impact on that in the last few days in the long end of the Treasury curve, which uh, has steepened. Let's look at inflation, because when I said, and you uh, liberally quoted for me, thank you, when I said fixed income, uh, long duration bonds are, I think, an insane investment. Why? Because I think there is a threat of inflation. Let's look at the traditional triggers of it. Excess demand, well, no, that's not one. Money printing and expansive federal fiscal policies. Uh, sure, for sure, we have that. How about an accelerating velocity of money? Hard as hell to measure, but you're beginning to see some pickup in that. And then one I think is probably the most important. You have economic dysfunction and supply chains being replicated as onshoring is occurring particularly with global, global trade declining. Okay, think back not so many years when you had stagflation. What about supply 
supply-driven inflation. Not demand-driven, which is easier to understand, but supply-driven. You're starting to see food prices escalate, clearly some rebound in energy from a low level. And you're starting to see people say, geez, I'm getting pounded in my corporation. I've got to raise some of my prices. If that were to occur, as I noted, long bonds of a long duration at a fixed rate, you think about it, why in God's green earth would I own one? I'm not getting much money. The yield is very low. Let's say a 10-year treasury is, you know, 50 bips or so, it bounces around. And yet if rates go up, 100, 200, 300 basis points, I'm going to have principal losses if I go to sell the bond. So then adding to that challenge is, you know, that old hoary advice that uh, people have given us for years. What do I want? I want a 60-40 portfolio, 60% equities, 40% traditionally long bonds. I think we have to relax that constraint because as I've said, long bonds don't seem to be very attractive. Well, what the hell is that 40% supposed to be doing? That 40% traditionally, and by the way, the 60-40 portfolio it has pretty much there's a lot of research on it. If somebody's curious, I'm happy to send it out. 60-40 portfolios have outperformed pretty much every other mix. So it's not stupid to think about it. But boy, how the heck do you implement it? Because that 40% is supposed to be a counterbalance for the volatility in equities. Well, if they're now getting pretty correlated, which they have been, and if owning long bonds now pays little, has high risk, very little upside for rates to go lower, because the Fed has said, uh, no, we're not using negative rates like Europe. What do I do? And therein gets to be, I think, a pretty interesting discussion, if we should pursue it, Angelo. <laughs> that was a horrific picture you painted about kind of the reality of where, and horrific in terms of you're telling the truth, by the way, in terms of the, re, the reality of where we are now. Uh, of course, we're going to talk about what else could be done other than 6040, specifically with the bond part of their portfolio. But I am going to leave people hanging a little bit before we discuss some of the niche and some of the opportunities that could be beneficial, because I think we still need to set somewhat of a foundation here. You gave me a lot to chew on. And even let's go to the public markets a little bit. And again, I covered that early to some degree in my open. Uh, it's dominated by the big giants that are doing amazing. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, uh, Walmart, Microsoft, etc. But if you were to take out like the the top tech firms, it's terrible in terms of what the market's doing. It's really driven by these gigantic firms getting bigger and bigger. Is this sustainable? And I don't know. Maybe it is sustainable, by the way. Uh, but should an investor who's incredibly wealthy be concerned about being overly allocated to the public markets? And should they be more tactical now that obviously there's definitive winners? Should they double down on the winners? But then when do you know when to get off that ride? Timing is very hard. Timing is hard. And uh, being the cynic that I am, I don't, I have never seen in my long period of observation of the financial markets that anybody, or very few anyway, that consistently can predict and timing of getting in and out of the market. Uh, on any, you know, and there's endless research, most of it turns out to be a question of luck when people try to do it. Okay, specifically to your question. The FANG stocks, a little more expanded than that, clearly have been the dominant players and you'd say, 
kind of logical. The technology has been compelling, the bigger getting bigger, eyeballs count, and they have the ability to buy up anybody that competes with them. Now, will that continue? And then it gets into, and I hate to even touch on this, politics. What happens if the political climate changes? And pretty much between both Republicans and Democrats, there's now a discussion in a very unusual way about antitrust. Antitrust typically is said, well, if you don't have a uh, degradation in pricing to the end consumer, you don't have an antitrust issue. Now that's beginning to be reinterpreted in the antitrust division, and clearly a democratic constituency historically would be much more aggressive. All right, so government action could uh, impact some of these tech giants and maybe put a little dent in their lofty uh, PE ratios. However, would I eschew equities and say, oh, no, equities are overpriced, forget about it? No. I think there have been interesting places to invest in equities, even though we focus pretty much on the debt side. In equities, I actually went out on a limb, and I was a little nervous about it. In March, March 23rd was the big crunch. I noted having in an earlier incarnation started an internet business, which grew finely battered and bruised in the uh, auto sector. And you had to think, well, what's happened? People aren't driving or much less. They're staying at home. Well, what will that do to all the auto insurers? Well, we've seen it. They gave back money to their policyholders saying, gee, our claims experience has uh, dramatically improved. Did they give all the money back to their policyholders? No, they kept a lot. As, uh, and then I said, one great stock has to be progressive. It's one of the uh, all-time great companies in the space. Uh, very, very advanced in their underwriting. And if their loss experience is dramatically improved, and they're one of the leaders anyway, the stock was trading uh, 70s and 80s, uh, low 70s. So it seems to me, Angelo, that was a relatively low risk opportunity. And happily, uh, it's been confirmed and the stock keeps reaching new highs recently. I think there are other interesting, gosh, dare I say it, niche stocks that are out there. I'm not a stock picker per se, but I think there are opportunities. Value stocks, another thing some of the audience I'm sure is, uh, likes, have been value traps. They haven't really changed, but someday they will come back. I think another interesting place on this 60-40 balance, just to use your uh, jumping off point. If you say, well, I want something to dampen the volatility, let's say, of uh, the Tesla tech companies of the world. Well, maybe I should get a stable high dividend payer of which there are a number out there. All right, maybe not the same octane, high octane as some of the other stocks, uh, but it's your anchor to windward to dampen the volatility of the balance of your equity portfolio. So maybe I'm saying cheating that on that, consider that in your 40% bucket to uh, dampen some of the volatility, uh, as you noted, in the concentration of returns that's occurred. Um, I think there are other interesting plays off the beaten path. You know, you said the word, I love it, niche. I think even there's some big companies that you'd say are pretty niche. Now, I always laugh when I think of that word niche. <laughs> Is it niche or niche? 
Um, and so I sort of said, all right, what the hell does the word mean? You know, we throw it around with abandon. And, you know, I studied it and said, all right, why do I like Nietzsche stuff? And what do, even on equities or debt? And I would say it describes the position of an activity that fits particularly well into its own ecosystem. Think, you know, supp the supply chain of, as an ecosystem. Usually this position, if it's Nietzsche or Nietzsche, is defensible by the company or the activity, sustainable, and may enjoy fewer competitors. To use a biological example, all right, a panda bear is a niche bear. Why? A panda bear, being huge, has an unusual diet. It eats bamboo. And does it have to eat a hell of a lot of bamboo to be as big as they are? That limits them. They have about a three-mile radius. So you got to plant a panda bear in a bamboo patch and leave it alone. So that's sort of a specialized niche. In contrast, a more generalized niche, and I'll give some examples in the investment world when you want to get there. A more generalized biological example, which certainly all of us in California see almost nightly, are coyotes. Coyotes will eat almost anything. They've adapted to their environment. Of course, they'll eat a stray dog or cat, sadly. But they're a more generalized, niche player in their ecosystem. They defend it. They're sustainable. They're growing like weeds, the, the coyote population. They're even in New York City, my old homestead. Kind of amazing. All right, so that's niche. I think you got to go beyond that and say why at least the Snyder almost bigoted about niche stuff. What are the characteristics in addition to that of a niche investment? Here's a big one. And we've all been taught this. Typically, there's lower correlation to other investments because it's in its own space. So you can really have real diversification. And we know that's a protection against volatility, 60-40. Nassim Taleb uses a great word. Got it, it's so rich in meaning. He calls it anti-fragile, hard to break a niche investment. Now, the negative, again, because it's niche, is it can be limited in scale, but limited in scale for maybe most of the investors on the call or family office. And limited in scale may be, oh, gee, it can only go to one or two billion dollars in scale. All right, that's a problem. Years ago when I was managing, or maybe they were managing me, the product areas for Morgan Stanley. I used to say and had an army of professional types that said, look, we can't mess around with any investment that we can't put a billion dollars in. Most family offices, your very effective audience, Angelo, don't have that constraint. They, you know, typically invest something less than multiple billions. So niche investments can appeal. Then I'll tack in on one other dimension, if you take niche and you think fixed income. Here's what we know. There are huge unknowns today. You ask for a macro overview. Oh my goodness. We know a known unknown. Will there be a second wave of COVID in the fall? If that were to happen, 
I'm not sure the market's anticipating it. It's going to get pretty dicey. Therefore, I would argue for prudence in a portfolio, you want to be very sensitive to duration. Whether that's private equity, think private equity. Private equity is long duration. People that invested in the height of the market 2007 in private equity had crummy returns. So you want to be sensitive to that, even on something that's performed so very, very well as private equity. So I would be sensitive these days to niche and duration. Yes, you bring up good points. And some of the challenges, like you said, mainly for institutions that have defined parameters are scale and liquidity, and sometimes a lack of resources and information. Families of wealth and SFOs are generally more Machiavellian, have an opportunity to be more tactical, which probably leads to my next point. How most family office level institutional investors is somewhat institutional. Uh, it tends to focus on developing an investment policy statement, which I would completely agree with, and probably skews towards being strategic in its asset allocation with a long-term perspective. And in most markets, I'm probably on board with that. But I think in what we're going through now for the seven reasons you outlined, and yes, we are likely to get a second wave. Uh, and I kind of hinted at that about 20 minutes ago about this is going to be with us on some level for a while, and it's going to be devastating to the markets. Just wait until we get to real estate. That's coming. But this isn't a chance for families and family offices to be more tactical in their investment approach. Even if they want to be more, well, we think 20 years out, it's strategic, it's long term. I hear you, but I think there's times where you could take advantage of dislocations in the market, but also have a chance to hedge certain risk that you may have, like you said, in fixed securities. We didn't even get into, and maybe not the strongest point of niche investments. You hinted at it. It's going to be the upcoming election. The inevitability, no matter who wins with the deficit and how things are trending to an increase in taxes, you are based in California. Most of the live people on the call today are in California. From everything that's been going on there, let's even forget about COVID. The taxes are horrific there, which is why you're seeing a flight to Texas, to Florida, and to other locations. This is very damaging, I think, as beautiful as California is, is just very damaging to people of wealth and success that want to get income, that want to be active investors, but are going to be concerned about the tax picture. So now you have being more tactical, trading more actively, perhaps being involved in more niche investments that probably, unless they're wrapped up in a private placement wrapper, are not going to be as efficient from a tax perspective you never want to let the tail wag the dog, but the tail appears to be getting a little bigger, Alan. Uh, yes. Now, um, I think the cusp of change creates opportunity. And you look at change and say, Angela, you alluded to it. Think about the change in the real estate game. Out here in California, there's so much wealth that's been tied to successful investing in real estate. Why? You had this incredible burgeoning economy in California. Not to denigrate anybody's performance, but just owning any real estate in California in the 70s, 80s, and 90s was almost a guaranteed win. It's a great, it was a great move. <laughs> okay. But today, maybe with COVID, think about what's happened to some of the real estate. Office buildings, forbearance on rent. I talked to a um, real estate entrepreneur owns a bunch of office buildings. He was complaining, crying, woe is me. In one of his buildings, 83% of the tenants were not paying rent. It was forbearance. And he said, Alan, what the hell am I supposed to do? My mortgage lender 
is not so enthusiastic about me not paying him. It's not a government loan. He said, I'm afraid I'm going to lose the building and it, I, it will be taken away. It will be foreclosed upon. So some of those changes, macroeconomic or governmental acts, and I'll get to another one on real estate, pounded office buildings, clearly macro change malls troubled. The classic thing, I can remember doing tons of this years and years ago, multifamily, AKA apartment buildings, a lot of, you can't, uh, not that you should, but you cannot evict somebody generally that's not paying you rent. Again, maybe great social policy, but if you own, you're an investor and own a piece or all of that multifamily building, how do you pay the mortgage? Most apartment buildings have leverage 50 to 80%. How do you pay the mortgage? It's a problem. So I think you've got to be very sensitive to these areas of change in some of these investment areas, whether it's as niche as uh, conceivably an apartment building uh, or an office building, uh, a REIT. The REITs have gotten pounded in like a tent post. So I think you got to be careful about that and try to look out and hopefully make a bet and be right. Um, so again, that drives me back uh, as a bigot about it to what we talked about early on, let's call it alt alternatives. <laughs> alt to the alts. Alt, alt to the alts, second derivative of alternatives. Yes, uh, and to even lay that groundwork a little further, I loved your analogy with the coyotes, how they adapted. Uh, and I know you're a fan of Taleb, I'm a gigantic fan made it into the name of my summer masterclass, which is up on the website, is the verbiage. Hopefully I won't get in trouble. Uh, I did it, the two words apart, not together like he does, anti-fragile. So coyotes have proven to be not even just adaptable, they might even be thriving during a challenging time. Uh, I think it's very hard to be perfectly so-called anti-fragile. When things turn upside down, you actually benefit. Uh, that's difficult, but you want to have the mindset to be able to be tactical, to have perhaps liquidity is needed, and to make some strategic decisions that hopefully do make you, quote unquote, anti-fragile. You know, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't exactly know where things are heading. Some of our most astute global economists and others, uh, now my audience sometimes knows what I think of them, you know, they're, they're as wrong as they're right. Uh, it, it's if investing was easy, you know, we'd all be Warren Buffett and basically Warren made some great strategic bets and held on to them decade after decade after decade in a tax favored manner with the insurance company didn't hurt as well. Uh, so let's jump into what are some of the alternative to alternatives that perhaps families could at least explore because it's probably not going to get for the reasons you already noted a great institutional capital. This is going to come from families. What are some of these investments? All right, let's go through for fun uh, a list and I'll try to give a little thumbnail on each one. One thing I would say, you, you alluded to it earlier and thank you. Um, you're right, we do write a lot of stuff about niche investments and about how to do diligence them because diligencing is critical. And for anybody that's on the call, uh, there's a couple of things. Go to shinnecock.com and you'll find a fair number of articles that describe in detail some of these alt alternatives that I'm going to talk about. And uh, that's S-H-I-N-N-E-C-O-C-K.com. And uh, Andrew, you said nice things about our scribblings. If anybody would like to get on our list to receive them as we write them, send me an e email, that's fine, A. Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R, 
at Shinnecock.com. Okay, I sound like a political convention here, but let's get into it. There's litigation finance, financing litigation. Um, some people hate the thought of that. Certainly companies don't like it. A couple of ways of playing it. It's an interesting one. Tricky, because the courts are generally closed. That's a problem. You can finance law firms. You can do short duration, think slip and fall cases, or you could do much longer duration and certainly lumpier and riskier intellectual property, think patent litigation finance. Just to rattle along quickly, the problem with that category today is supply, the opportunities to invest with a debt or equity are very limited because of the court slowdown or shutdown. Another area, <clears throat> booming, debt settlement. You can do that either equity investor or debt investor. This is basically financing the marketing for these debt settlement companies to find more people for them to serve. In a nutshell, what are they doing? They're saying to somebody that's over their skis and credit card debt, saying, it's okay, you can't pay it all. We will negotiate on your behalf with the credit card companies and knock your debt down, they would argue, by 50%. And when they knock it down, they get, of course, get a piece of that. Booming area, very interesting place to play. Having uh, got my fanny shot off running a $20 billion insurance company in my uh, misbegotten youth. Life settlement. Life settlement sort of become very popular, sort of buzzy. I would say be careful. The return, the historic returns have been terrific. This is basically when somebody wants to sell a life insurance policy that they no longer need, a financial intermediary steps in, buys the policy, pays the premiums until that ultimate mortality, death of the insured. <clears throat> so they're arbitraging that time frame. Here's the problem. Enormous capital has flowed into the space. So historic returns are gonna be less going forward. And you can see it that they're gradually eroding, maybe down to somewhere between six or 8%. <laughs> Still pretty attractive and not very correlated. Two watchwords, and we've written about this. <clears throat> if you're evaluating a, a life settlement player, be very focused on the difference between a realized gain and in unrealized mark-to-market gain. Be very, very important. Uh, second, <clears throat> in the early days of life settlement, the trendy thing was to say, well, I'm gonna buy very large policies from older age people because I know they're gonna have their ultimate uh, maturity shortly. Well, the thing that was maybe overlooked a little bit is that those older people that have large face amount of policies are generally wealthy. And wealth gives somebody uncommon access to the healthcare system. So a lot of those portfolios <coughs> extended in duration, lowering the returns. Another area gotten, again, trendy too, called ILS, Insurance Linked Securities. Here, all different flavors, cat bonds, catastrophe bonds against hurricanes like Laura that just happened <coughs> uh, is one way to play it. Tricky, very complicated, an opportunity at some scale, but I would say whatever you do, get an insurance expert. There's almost no financial person that has the necessary expertise to carefully evaluate a portfolio. All right, rolling along, trade finance. 
Got to move something, let's say a cargo of grain from Africa to China. Who's going to finance that trade? Banks have pulled out, by and large. The attractiveness of it is it's short duration. Although with COVID, sand has been thrown in the gears. The yields are typically lower than a lot of other things. And the focus has migrated more to emerging markets and frontier markets with their own sets of risk. If you do it, I would say do it in loans or, or equity strategies that are dollarized as opposed to local currencies, which can have uh, extreme volatility. One other thing to tack on, there are some insurers that will offer insurance as to the investment up to 90%. Again, rate of return historically before COVID was maybe eight to 10. Now it's probably uh, close to two to three for this year so far, uh, but gradually ever so slowly climbing back. Another interesting area, uh, we, we do live in Hollywood. I, I actually live in West LA, but in the land of fruits and nuts in California. Think film music finance. An interesting area has been years ago was to buy a package of uh, royalties on, on songs, which you could buy. A lot of that's dissipated and the record business has dramatically changed. However, you're now seeing the second wave, which is kind of interesting. Getting a royalty stream against streaming, rate Spotify, et cetera, all of the streaming services where the performing artist wants to sell their royalty stream, which is well tracked, that's a good thing, because there's not as much touring, so they need the money. That's created an interesting opportunity. Film finance, we've written about that. Uh, you can see it at Shinnecock.com. Very tricky, a lot of sleazy, sleazy accounting in the film business. Sounds great, and if you think about it, how many studios are able to predict blockbusters? Um, so, then how the heck are you gonna do that as an individual investor? All right, I um, still have a few more to go. Specialty finance. Think about back to that 40%, that overall rubric for this conversation. Gotta get in that 40% some things that will counterbalance equity volatility. All right, I'll give you some do's and don'ts, at least my prejudice. Specialty finance, think non-bank lending. Okay. And banks actually have really pulled back, uh, which is bad for the economy. The classic one, which we've written about at length, merchant cash advance. Think of a furniture store that's selling furniture and says, gee, Angelo, we'll finance your purchase as you pay it off over time using your credit card. That revenue stream can be sold to an MCA player. Think of a restaurant that's getting credit card receipts. So the, the MCA player will say, hey, great, okay, we'll give you 50 grand and we'll nick you 10% of all your credit card receipts until we get our bacon back. Oops, blood in the streets, not hard asset collateral for sure. What happened when all those restaurants either went under, sadly, very sadly, or their business declined by over 50%. So MCA players have gotten hammered. In fact, I heard a war story just the other day. Guy said to me, I had lunch with him. Alan, I watched this guy raise $100 million in MCA. I said, did people know what they were investing? He said, no, but he was, was like moths drawn to the flame. He was printing high, you know, medium high 
double digit yields for three years. I said, what happened? The 100 million is now worth zero. Oops, so be careful. Receipt, receivable finance factoring is old as the hills. Very, very interesting area, widespread. Think of all this PPE, masks, be careful. A lot of regulations, some people have gotten burned there. We do some of that. I think the more traditional places uh, to do factoring is interesting. Be careful, watchword there is, think about what advance rate, how much against a dollar of receivables are you as the investor willing to advance? Uh, you see some nitwit deals that get up to 95%, very risky, even if it's an outstanding credit or the person that owes you the receivable, they may decay, decline, the product that's being delivered to them, which certainly, think about it, has dramatically happened in the clothing business, where they said, oh, great, we can't sell it, take it back. Tricky issue. A Couple of others, and then I'll get to my favorites. Here's an interesting one, check off payroll loans. You see that in some of the emerging market areas, think South Africa, Argentina, et cetera, where you have a government worker that may need a loan against their paycheck. Okay, and the government will collect it or deduct the payment for the loan on your behalf as the lender. Uh, Puerto Rico, for example, is cranking that opportunity up. Pretty interesting. It's sort of uh, the second cousin of payday lending in the US, which has gotten such a bad name because the rates are so high. Payday lenders, be careful. They're, they historically were in the uh, sites of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB, uh, when Elizabeth Warren really cranked it up. She said, oh, payroll lending is terrible. And interestingly enough, the Pew organization, certainly fairly far to the left, said, are you kidding? These people need that. So the payday lenders have migrated a little bit to doing installment loans. All right. One last one's kind of interesting. Government advances. In Australia, they will fund certain types of R&D research. But the government is slow in processing. Maybe they may agree to do it, but they're slow in execution. So there's been a uh, group of people that will then pre-finance those receivables from the government. So you know you have a great credit from the government uh, and uh, highly secure and Fascinatingly, pretty attractive yields. All right, before everybody gets totally bored on a Friday afternoon, my favorite, tangible real assets, lending against them. You've got oil and gas, very tricky, it's a commodity. You've got commodities, gold, and there's some interesting ways of playing lending against gold, or you can buy gold long. Uh, certainly worth considering. Real estate we talked about, so I won't dwell on that. Collectibles, you know, lending against exotic cars. I'm not a big believer because I think the price volatility is too high. Watches, a lot of lending against watches today. Coins and stamps, and my particular favorite, which we do, is lend against high-end museum quality fine art. What's the trade? The trade is, I'll give you one we're currently thinking about, lending against a Chagall painting. The Chagall painting's been appraised at $15 million. We're thinking about extending a $5 million loan. All right, you extend the loan, this has to warm everybody's black hearts on this call. 
you extend the loan typically for a one year term, short duration, yay. And we take delivery of the art, we control it and put it in a bonded climate controlled warehouse. If the borrower were not to pay, in this case, the 5 million back, we would sell the art. And in that case, the loan to value ratio is basically 33%. Plenty of room to be wrong. All right, why else? You gotta never take yourself too seriously, right? This is like being a high-end Angelo pawnbroker. Take <laughs> delivery of the collateral. You gotta laugh at yourself. All right, why do I think this is so nifty? Yields are attractive, high control over the collateral, AKA low risk. We've been at it for three and a half years. We've yet to have a default, notwithstanding COVID. I'm sure we will have one in the future, but we haven't to date. The collateral, the collateral is really strong. Over the last 50 years, high-end museum quality fine art has appreciated at a compound 8%. If you want to loan against something, get something that's appreciating, as opposed to maybe a car, which has the depreciation like a falling rock. So it's an appreciating asset to lend against. Another neat thing, unlike a real estate building, which can be a good investment, you buy a real estate building, an apartment building in LA. Great, as long as the LA market's doing well, you'll do well. The LA market's not doing so well, Mm, what do you do? Art, pretty neat, it's like gold. It moves around the world with currencies and relative economic strength in different areas. So, let's say you have the Chagall, the US tanks, sell it in Hong Kong, even more likely sell it in China, sell it in Abu Dhabi, sell it in London easily transportable. A couple other things for the cynics in the crowd. I think losing money is really a bummer. Uh, so what has been the historic experience in this space? There's one major index of museum quality fine art that's been through two major auctions before it gets adapted into the index. Yay. Here's a th fun thing, question. I, I, it's hard to get everybody to respond, but I was shocked by this. The largest declination of this asset class was not 0809, it was 1990, when you had a mild recession, the market was a little thinner, and art went down 25%. So what does it say? Don't have a high loan to value ratio. Okay, what happened in 08, 09? Equities went down, the S&P went down 56%. NASDAQ went down 72%. Oh my Lord. High-end art went down 22.5%. Pretty good. Certainly better than everything else and it recovered. The average price volatility in art over any two year window of time is 8%. Hmm, not bad. So you wanna have a carefully wrought um, loan to value ratio. Typically we do 40%, giving us a nice buffer. How big is the market? Shocker, $64 billion of art transactions on average a year. There's $24 billion of loans. And a lot of the borrowers, there aren't too many players. So where do you want to invest? Angela, back to your gating question. You want to be in places that are capital short. Before the, you know, the great washing in of capital drives returns lower. Art is like that today. So in a summary, 
attractive attributes are compelling yield. The gross yield, we have two ways to play with this. One is in a fund vehicle, which is very tax advantaged. One is doing one-off deals with us, which we do a lot of. Compelling yield, the gross yield on average is about 10%. Short duration, currently in our fund vehicle, it's about five months because you've averaged out over a year. It's liquid. You have a change of heart. I love that. I'm a chicken. Nervous Nelly, as you said early on. <laughs> Controlled collateral. You got the damn collateral. It's not, I got to go chase somebody to get the collateral. And the tax advantage structure in the fund vehicle is very unusual. Uh, we killed a lot of brain cells to do it. Got a lot of legal help, three different law firms. Of course, you know, they're expensive. There's no effectively connected income for an offshore investor, for a tax qualified investor. There is no UBTI tax. Here's a, a sidebar for all these alt alts. In most funds today, you'll get an ugly surprise in your K-1. <laughs> and they don't count it. The people that have got you into this investment, what do I mean? The investment expenses that they incur to evaluate whatever you're investing in, they can't deduct from tax. And it flows through the K-1. Oops, surprise. We were able to, with a lot of help, figure out a way to make all of those expenses tax deductible. It saves an investor 100 to 125 basis points. So that's, <clears throat> I'll take a breather. Those are some of our thoughts on alt alts. My particular favorite, very conservative, maybe too conservative for people on the call, is uh, the art lending. That was fantastic, Alan, and incredibly insightful and different than most of the economic finance and more traditional investing talks we've had. Probably the most consistent investment topic we covered, partially due to my membership's interest in mine and my activity in Silicon Valley, has been VC. And there's lots of interesting things occurring there because these times are forcing and motivating people to be creative. Uh, but that's not going to be the core focus of what you're talking about. One, it's always fine to someone who's a great uh, fan of Taleb, so that's always in itself great. And I think your articulation of the art market and what you're doing in lending was fantastic. This summer, including just this week, uh, those of you that are on the call that would like to get a replay, we've covered art significantly, not from a lending perspective, perspective per se, but just a, a deeper perspective. And many of the people that have been on my call, my calls this week, uh, I noted that this summer I undertook several research projects. I revamped my website. I've done a whole bunch of white papers and research. Some I'll be rolling out a little bit later in the year. And what's called a masterclass, which is effectively up on my new website now. Uh, and a lot of the common themes I heard from the multi-billion dollar plus families was, yes, they didn't start to own art as an investment per se. It just kind of worked out that way. And then they put greater rigors around it. But owning art, earning gold, uh, a lot of them own global income producing businesses. They look at that depending on the industries and the diversity as being a hedge. Uh, so lots of interesting insights. But what you spoke about in terms of niches, now again, scalability, uh, scalability and liquidity, the tax picture, and for some of the things you noted, but you did hint at it, diligence, diligence, diligence. Uh, there are some unfortunately bad apples in the space as well. Litigation finance had a terrible reputation with some things that went terribly wrong on fraud a couple of years ago. But in these inefficient markets, and that's kind of what they are, uh, especially non-correlated, that's where the opportunity can lie for those that are more alpha-seeking than just settling for beta. Yeah, 
w one thing you triggered and devil makes me say this is <clears throat> on our website which having been tortured by many investors over the years and now uh, torturing other managers and other uh, asset allocators there is uh, several articles on doing due diligence and the tricky thing on alt alts is the bad news it takes more energy in the due diligence there is one article in particular that uh, you can use everybody on the call 316 different questions to consider in investing in a particular asset or with a particular group of people. Uh, Y'all might find it interesting and helpful to add to your repertoire. Oh, wow, 316. I can't wait to see that. It's funny that you brought it up. Uh, in Right before the coronavirus, we published, effectively, it's an ebook. It's like 50 plus pages uh, with my friend Rishi Ganti. Uh, who it was strictly about diligence of alternative managers. Uh, those of you that want to email me, if you don't have it, uh, it is really for members, but for those on the Zoom call today, I'll open it up. You just have to email me. I'll get to my contact information shortly. And that's probably about 200 plus questions when you break out the various sections, but this even tops that, 316, combine yeah, them both yeah, together. They're... Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have a book as big of as big as an encyclopedia, as if people still use those anymore. Oh well, for people in a little closer to our age bracket, Alan, we understand that having a good book in your hands, it's hard to beat that. Sounds and true. what I would like to do, we do have some feedback from the audience. I also want to be respectful of Alan's time and schedule and have a little bit of a close. So why don't we just go to one or two of them? A one coming in, uh, and you briefly went very briefly, Alan, but I guess the uh, participant would like a little more detail. If you could expand on your Puerto Rico lending opportunity that you mentioned is what he's asking. Okay, and the Puerto Rican lending opportunity is <clears throat> several of the unions have agreed that you can go through what's called Hacienda, which is a government entity, and it'll process payroll, and you can lend to their, let's say the police union, to one of the policemen, they, the government jobs are highly uh, regarded, so there's not a lot of job turnover, because not a lot of jobs, hard to get a job in Puerto Rico. So you have somebody that is gonna stay employed, that's good. You can underwrite the, the borrower, and then lend the money, and Hacienda will, will, as a government entity, will deduct the repayment of your loan from the police person's paycheck. Uh, pretty interesting play. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. And on that note, I think we covered a lot of ground. Would love to have you back soon. Likely after the election, let's kind of get a little bit of how the markets have reacted and a variety of different opinions. So we do look forward to that. Uh, one more time, Alan, for those that would like to learn more about your firm, and again, I highly recommend your you and your team's writing in the blog, was that shinnecock.com? It is. S, I don't know if you can read it behind me, S-H-I-N-N-E-C-O-C-K.com. And God forbid, if you want to get these scribblings directly, uh, send me an email and I'll try to make it happen. A for Alan, A Snyder, S N Y D E R, at shinnecock.com. That was fantastic. I'm going to give a bit of a close now, Alan. Uh, one, because this was obviously an investment discussion, just a reminder, this is strictly for educational, and I would say some entertainment perspective. We hope you get value out of it, but like Alan said multiple times, the word diligence, you need to do your own diligence. You need to understand your risk parameters, your timeline, 
Uh, and likely, if you're listening to whether this in a Zoom or a podcast, really should be a, a qualified purchaser plus, in my opinion, more so of an actual, more institutional level, single family office. These are complex issues. You need to have a greater grasp of them and you need to really seek out your own advice and guidance to that. So that's my little disclaimer. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of the Angelo Robles podcast. You could easily find me on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, all the big platforms. I've been very, very lucky uh, because we're doing so many of these that the podcast itself around the world has done very, very well. I also noted I'm the founder and CEO of Family Office Association, a global membership organization dedicated to the family office community. I've been doing this for many years. We adapted very quickly to COVID and in many ways are uh, more successful and active than ever before, becoming digital, becoming global. Uh, one of my members who's not on the call now really put it best. I stole his tagline. You went from doing 10 events a year to doing 200 because I often do these Monday through Friday and I've had amazing guests on. I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, please check out our new website. We're very excited about it. Same URL, but the everything is new in it. It's familyofficeassociation.com, my email, especially those that want the ebook that I referenced because I'm not gonna be able to uh, notice your request here as much in the Zoom. It's angelo at familyofficeassociation.com. I'm incredibly active on social media, mainly YouTube, which simply is Family Office, so you could find me. And again, do check out the new site. There's tremendous resources, more so specifically for our members, but we do give some content away that could be some resources that could be valuable to you and really take a look at the master class and additional new resources that we've been very very active with on that note everyone thank you for our live audience today and a special thank you not only to our good friend kathleen tepley that reintroduced us or got us back together alan so she's always fantastic and wonderful but a special Ooh. thank you of course to alan snyder everyone have a great day thank you happy weekend